Well, uh, open your Bibles to Judges chapter 6. Uh, Judges chapter 6. That's uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Seventh book of the Bible, all right? Judges chapter 6. And I'm going to share with you about miracles. And uh, let me just let you know that I don't have three points, so that is the first miracle. <laughs> God's already doing miracles among us, <laughs> already. Um, about three months ago, Steve and I talked about this, and uh, I said, I, I, uh, I want to speak at Habitation, and uh, we put it on the calendar, and about two months ago, the Lord spoke to me that it was going to be about miracles. And as we got closer and closer, God began to speak to me about miracle night and that he was going to begin a season, this is not just for tonight, but tonight begins a season of miracles for Gateway Church. A season of miracles. And then as I told you this weekend, the Lord told me to preach on Jesus the physician. And so I began to see this is a miracle weekend. And uh, Friday morning, Steve sent me a text. His daughter, Kristen, is pregnant and do uh, the 1st of June, around June 3rd. And uh, he sent all the elders a text and said, please pray for Kristen. We've gotten a report that's very serious from the doctor. They're gonna do a test tomorrow. Please pray. So all the elders respond, we're praying, we're praying. And when I saw the text, I thought about Miracle Weekend. And uh, so I sent back, I'm praying also, but God reminded me that I'm preaching on healing this weekend and miracles Sunday night at Habitation. I was already planning to tell the whole church this is Miracle Weekend. This is why this was actually an email, I remember now. And, but this is what I wrote in the email. So I declare that Miracle Weekend begins now and that this is Miracle Weekend for Kristen and Ella in Jesus' name. And that's the, the name of the baby to come. And uh, then last night, Steve told me that when she went back the next day, that all of her uh, levels were normal. She was the, completely good. So, so that was Friday. So I, I, then I found out something else that happened on Thursday. So I'm gonna tell you about that. But what I feel like is that I declared this was, I felt like the Holy Spirit told me to declare a miracle weekend, but I felt like the Holy Spirit this past week said, uh, I can't wait till the weekend. So. <laughs> So Thursday, I told you that uh, I had lunch with the governor and I was coming back and I was driving on 35 and I was coming up to the 170 exit there by Cabela's and uh, a few miles before I got there, about 10 cars in front of me was this black car with its flasher zone and it was driving in the middle of the two lanes so no one could go around it. And uh, so I'm thinking, you know, come on, what's the deal here and what's going on? And, and uh, I really was, I didn't have a lot of uh, compassion. And, um, <laughs> and then I saw this gray car, which I thought was trying to pass the black car. I'll tell you in a moment, it wasn't, but, and there are these concrete uh, dividers out there, you know, because of construction on 35. And I saw this gray car hit one of those concrete things and bounce off of it. And uh, I thought, man, I, what is happening up there? And then the gray car and the black car took the exit at 170. And uh, there was an 18-wheeler stopped at the light. And the gray car ran into the back of the 18-wheeler and went up underneath the 18-wheeler. And I just immediately thought, I've, I've got to go and see if I can help. And so, uh, and what I realized was that there was a problem with the lady, an elderly lady in the car I don't know if she had um, a stroke or what, but the black car behind was trying to protect people from you know, getting close to her so she would not be hurt. And so anyway, I jumped out, ran over, and the lady who was driving the black car, she was on the phone, I said, are you calling 911? And she said, yes. And then she said, Pastor Robert? <laughs> then I'd repent for my attitudes about the lady. And uh, anyway, she said, I'm a member of Gateway. And I said, good. I said, praise the Lord. I'm glad you're calling. And you know, da, da. So then we went, I went around to the door 
and there was a man there trying to help the lady that had run into this 18-wheeler. And again, her car now is up underneath the 18-wheeler. As an elderly lady, and she was completely unresponsive. And um, uh, so I was trying to help him, and he turned up and he looked. He said, Pastor Robert? <laughs> and he was the member of Gateway. <laughs> and, uh, and then I just felt like, you know, we need to pray. I think this woman has had some sort of a stroke or a diabetic attack or something, but she's totally unresponsive. And um, so I just laid my hands on her and began to pray, and this member of Gateway began to agree with me in prayer. And we prayed, and then in a moment, the paramedics pulled up. So I went back, and I began to explain to him what happened, how she hit the guardrail and how she was unresponsive. And I said, you know, it could be a diabetic thing, could be a stroke, I don't know. But I just want to let you know what happened. And the paramedic said, Pastor Robert? So, so it was all Gateway members helping this lady. Matter of fact, the truck driver she ran into came back and I said, are you okay? And he said, yes, Pastor Robert. So, and he did, not, he did not attend Gateway, he attends another good church, but he said, I watch you every week on television. So anyway, um, so we prayed over this lady and I thought, okay, the paramedics are here and so, you know, I can leave now. So this morning, Pastor Marcus Burkeen at our North Fort Worth campus uh, sent a text to Pastor Josh, my son, said, please forward this to your dad. This is what the text said. One of our TSN guards is a paramedic. He attended a wreck by Cabela's that your dad saw and stopped and prayed for the woman. All of the paramedics were convinced that she was going to die. But she was talking by the time we arrived at the hospital. And he wanted your dad to know that his prayers made a difference. So uh, my point is, it's Miracle Weekend. And I don't know why God chose this weekend, but he did. And there are Kairos times, appointed times, and, and months ago, God led me to declare this miracle night as a pastor. And so, as the, as the pastor of Gateway Church, I'm telling you, by the Spirit of the Lord, that we're about to enter a season of miracles. So, I'm going to share with you a little different message uh, again, as I said, not three points, but just to share with you something from Scripture about miracles and then another testimony, and then we're going to pray and we're going to watch God do miracles tonight. Amen. Tonight. Uh, Judges chapter 6, uh, you have to understand that uh, the Israelites have entered the promised land. That was in Joshua. They've conquered. The Midianites have now come back. They've encamped around uh, many of the tribes, and they're, they were cutting off their food sources. And uh, so God appears to this man named Gideon, all right? And uh, Judges chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Verse 12. And the angel of the Lord, I want you to notice that the angel of the Lord here is capitalized. Most theologians believe that when the Bible, the Old Testament talks about the angel of the Lord, he's talking about Jesus himself. I believe that as well. Okay, so I believe this is Jesus showing up, talking to Gideon. And the angel, the messenger, the angel, capital A, capital A, of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you. I want you to notice those words. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Uh, now, I do need to explain to you, if I didn't tell you a moment ago, that Gideon was hiding from the Midianites at this time. But the Lord saw him as a mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? You ever felt that way? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites? If 
God is with us. Why has all this happened? And where are all his miracles? I'm sure you felt that way at some point. You might feel that way right now. If the Lord is with us, why has this happened? And where are all his miracles? Okay, let me, I'm just going to summarize the next few chapters, but it'd be wonderful for you to read these and read them in different versions. It's fun to read the Bible in different versions. I read this story in several different versions. I'm not sure how many at this point over the last two months. Uh, but I read it again in a different version today. So let me tell you kind of what happens here the rest of the story and answer the, the, the question, these questions. Why is all this happening? Where are all these miracles? So um, Gideon says, uh, please let me prepare a meal for you. And the angel of the Lord says, okay. And he goes and prepares it. Now, one thing I want you to notice through all of this is the patience of God. The patience of God. How long would it take to prepare a meal? And he sits there and waits. Remember, no microwaves back then. By the way, I have another miracle I want the whole church to pray for. I want you to pray that they begin making bluebell ice cream again. Okay, I, I, it's a, we need to pray, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm having serious withdrawals, all right? All right, so, so no microwaves. So how long would it take? So, the, the, I, I just want you to see the patience of God, the long-suffering of God, the kindness of God. So, the Lord waits, Gideon comes, and the Lord says, okay, put that on a rock. So, he puts it on a rock, and the Lord touches the meal with the end of his staff, and it burns up. Comple it's completely consumed just like that. Now, you have to get this, because I've got, <laughs> you just got to get this. He touches it, and it burns up. And then Gideon says, would you show me a sign? <laughs> I'm thinking the Lord is thinking. <laughs> you know, uh, big lighters haven't been invented yet, Gideon, you know. Um, I just touched it with a stick and it burned up. And you want a sign. But he says, okay. I'll give you a sign. It's the patience of God. It's phenomenal in this story. So, he sets out a fleece. You ever heard of this? This is where it comes from. This is the only passage in the Bible. This is the only place. And he puts a fleece of wool out, and he asks the Lord, Lord, will you let this fleece? And I, I want to say something about this, because maybe you've heard this put out a fleece. Uh, in my opinion... Uh, this was a fleece of doubt, not a fleece of faith with Gideon. I'm not saying your fleece was. I'm not saying it was a fleece of doubt. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you shouldn't put out a fleece. I'm just simply saying that Gideon wasn't doing this because he had faith. He was doing this because he had doubt. The reason I want to show you this is that God still did a miracle even with a guy that had bouts with doubt. So he puts his fleece out and he says... Would you let this fleece of wool be wet and the ground with dew and the ground around it dry in the morning? Okay, so God has to wait another day for Gideon to catch up with him. And God says, okay, I'll do that. So the next day, the, the ground all around was dry, the fleece was wet, and he wrung out a bowl full of water out of the fleece of wool is what the Bible says. And then he says, uh, would you give me another sign? This is the creator of the universe. Thinking, what? How many signs do you want? So he says, okay, I'll give you another sign. He said, this time, would you let the fleece be dry and the ground wet with dew? And the Lord says, okay. So it's another day. And so the next morning, the fleece was dry, the ground was wet. Okay, so then... He says, now call together the army, 32,000 men show up, 32,000 of Israel show up for the war. By the way, there were 135,000 Midianites in camp, 135,000 were encamped around them, 32,000 men show up, okay? And God says to Gideon, that's too many. 
Because what will happen is, I won't get the glory. I won't get the glory. Now, they were, that's over four times. You know, the Midianite army over four times. So, and so God says, make an announcement. Now, this is just great. I want you to think about this announcement. Third 2,000. And so he says, okay, uh, if anyone is afraid, <laughs> the Lord says you can go home. 22,000 went home. <laughs> 22,000. There were 10,000 left. 22,000. They said, you afraid? I'm a little bit afraid. Let's get some bluebell. Okay. All right. <laughs> so 10,000, 20, just think about how he's feeling. A third of them leave. Two-thirds, pardon me. Two-thirds leave. And so then, after that, the Lord says, there's still too many. I won't get the glory. They'll just think these were skilled. These were the ones that were unafraid. So he said, take them down to where you drink and have them drink and watch how they drink. And he said, the ones that lap water like a dog. And I don't, I don't want to go into a lot of um, detail here because I know things are played back on YouTube and all that. <laughs> but in essence... Listen, the ones that do this. <laughs> he said, you set those over to the side. And there were 300 that lapped water like a dog and 9,700 that didn't. Now, you know Gideon's thinking, I'm getting rid of, rid of the goofy ones. That's what God's doing. <laughs> And you remember what God did? He said, now that's your army. The dog lappers. <laughs> so he sends 9,700 home. He's got 300 left, listen, against 135,000 soldiers. And then the Lord knows how Gideon is, and he knows how you are, and he knows how I am. And so they're encamped at night. He says, Gideon, I want to encourage you. I want you to sneak down to the Midianite camp and listen and see what you overhear. So he sneaks down. Now think about the exact place where he sneaks, how God had all this, you know, planned. And even, it, it, it's the night before because he hears a dream. So God's got it all planned. He sneaks down. There's one soldier telling another soldier. He said, I had a dream last night that a loaf of bread came rolling down the hill and hit one of our tents and smashed it flat. And the other guy said, that means that God is with Gideon and we're going to be destroyed. Isn't that amazing? That was his interpretation of a loaf of bread <laughs> rolling down the hill and knocking over one tent. And apparently this thing spread throughout the camp because Gideon had these 300 men hold torches and cry out at the same time, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon and the Midianites turned and killed each other, 120,000 of them, of the 135,000, killed each other just like that, 120,000. And then Gideon pursued the 15,000 and killed them also, the 300 men. Okay, so here's his question. Where are all his miracles? Okay, I want to answer that question. All around us. All around us. He, he touched the sacrifice. He touched the meal with a stick. He did the fleece, made it wet. Then he made it dry. Then he had the dream. And then he had 300 defeat an army of 135,000. God's miracles are all around us. They're all around us. The problem is that Satan has us convinced that God doesn't work anymore. Or that God works in someone else's. God's miracles are all around us. They're all around us. 
The problem is that Satan has us convinced that God doesn't work anymore or that God works in someone else's life. Now, I want to clarify or extend, build on something I said today uh, in the weekend message, last night and today. Uh, I made a really good point. I said, you're bad enough for a miracle. You remember that? Okay, I'm not in any way condoning unrighteous living. No way, shape, or form. I mean, it's like Paul had to say when he's teaching on grace. Should, well, does this mean that we ought to just continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Okay, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that Satan takes our imperfections and says we're not worthy for a miracle. I just want you to know, you'll never be worthy except through the blood of Jesus. And he tries to disqualify us. And I, I, I want to take that away. We're qualified for miracles because we're God's children. Listen, Gideon was not this mighty man of valor without the Holy Spirit. I mean, he, he was one scared dude. And God was gracious and long-suffering with him. In, in the same way, we could go through the Bible. Abraham believed God. He was counting him for righteousness, but he lied about Sarah and then slept with Hagar. But God was still faithful. I'm just saying he wasn't perfect. Noah, who was even saved from the flood, when he gets off the ark, he gets drunk, and then his son it doesn't cover his nakedness. But God still, he was, the Bible says Noah was a righteous man. Uh, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob steals his brother's blessing. David commits adultery and murder, but the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. Again, listen to me, I'm not condoning sin. I'm just trying to say to you, you are a candidate for a miracle. Even though you have not been perfect or even though you're still dealing with something, the people in the Bible were dealing with things. Peter denies Jesus and preaches on the day of Pentecost. And he's the first one to raise someone from the dead. And then years later in his ministry, when Paul comes to uh, uh, Antioch, he has to rebuke Peter to his face, the Bible said, because Peter was eating with the Gentiles until the Jews showed up, and then he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. Paul said, I had to rebuke him to his face. And yet Peter worked great miracles. I, I, I'm just saying, none of us are perfect. That, I'm trying to say that, okay? All right, let me tell you an illustration here, and not an illustration, a story that happened. Pastor Olin, who's seated on the platform, he's one of our apostolic elders and my pastor. When he was pastoring Shady Grove Church back in the 70s, it was what was known as the charismatic renewal. People were discovering the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Shady Grove Church was Shady Grove Baptist Church. And his credentials are Baptist credentials. He went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. You have to remember, though, Nine, for nine years before he went to seminary, he was a Texas State Trooper, which prepared him real well to be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> but because the charismatic renewal was going on, there was a little excess at the time, you know. So this, someone invited him to come and speak in Illinois, and he got in the car with the pastor, and the pastor gave him a flyer and said, we passed these out all over town, and it had a, an oval picture of Pastor Olin uh, in the middle of it. And around it, it said, miracle worker, faith healer, pastor evangelist. And Olin said, I'm only one of those. <laughs> I'm a pastor. And then it said, Wednesday night, miracle night. And then it said this. Now, you'll get this. Bring the halt. We don't even know what the halt is anymore. It's old King James. Bring the halt, the lame, and the blind. And Pastor Olin said, you pass these out all over town? And the guy said, yep. And he said, it's our seven-year anniversary as a church, and I've told the church, Wednesday night, we're going to have more miracles than in the history of the church. <laughs> so Pastor Olin called the elders and said, guys, pray that I can come home. 
I can't, I can't do this. This is crazy. And so they prayed and they called him back and said, God says you're supposed to stay. So it's, he's preaching long. So Tuesday night, remember Wednesday night's Miracle Night. Tuesday night he's preaching, and every night there were two people from the congregation that were, that were sharing a three-minute testimony before the message. So this guy standing up sharing this testimony before Pastor Olin gets up to preach, and all of a sudden he stopped talking. And Pastor Olin looked at him, and remember he was a state trooper, and he realized what was happening, and all of a sudden this man fell over dead from a massive heart attack the night before miracle night. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to make fun of a person passing away, but this is awkward before miracle night <laughs> that a man dies in the pulpit. And so Pastor Olin thought he was kind of new in the Lord and things of the Lord, this is what God wants to do. He wants to raise this guy from the dead. So he went up there and <laughs> grabbed his coat and set him up <laughs> and said, I command you in Jesus' name. And while he was saying this, the guy fell back over. <laughs> this will affect your faith. The whole church was watching. The miracle worker. So he thought, well, I don't know what God wants to do. And so and he knew he was dead. He was a, he'd been a state trooper. He said, I, I knew he was dead. I'd seen many dead people, you know. And so, but I just, so he said, I raised him back up. And every time he said, I command you. And the guy just keep falling down. The next thing you knew, a paramedic tapped him on the shoulder and said, sir, you need to move aside. And they put the guy on a stretcher and took him down the center row of the church. The night before miracle night. That's tough. So Pastor Olin went home and, uh, and he was staying in the pastor's home. And he, he, before he got in bed, he just knelt beside the bed and he started praying, God, God, what are we going to do? I mean, a guy dies the night before miracle night. And then he said, I just felt like I need to get lower before God. So I got down on my face. He said, and then I noticed that this bed was one of these big high beds, you know. And I, so I just decided I'd just crawl up under the bed. <laughs> and he crawled up under the bed and there were dust bunnies, you know, up under the bed, you know. And he's up under the bed amongst these dust bunnies. And about one in the morning, the Lord said to him, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, well, I'm crying out to you. That's what I'm doing. Tomorrow's miracle night. And the Lord said to him, am I still God? He said, yeah, Lord, you're still God. He said, well, get out from under this bed and go to sleep. <laughs> he said he got out from the bed and he Kind of looked, he was in a bedroom standing in the pastor, but you know, he kind of looked around and see if anybody sees him, you know, getting out from the bed, gets in the bed, goes to sleep. As soon as he woke up, knees hit the floor, you know, boom, starts praying. And then he started to slide back up under the bed again to humble himself before God. And the Lord said to him, Olin, am I still God? And he said, Yes, Lord, you're still God. He said, Get up and get dressed and go to church. So he got up, they went to the church, and the pastor had to do some things, and so Pastor Olin just walked around the sanctuary and he started singing this song that came to him. And he just began to sing and worship, and all of a sudden, he said, before I knew it, the pastor said, you ready to go to lunch? He'd been singing in the sanctuary all that time. And they went to lunch and they did a few other things. They went home, they went to the service that night. It was packed. Packed so much they had to put chairs in the aisles, in the center aisle. There was a center aisle, two, two sections of pews and a center aisle. And they had to put chairs in the foyer. And he got up and he started preaching on the resurrection power of Jesus. And he said he had about a paragraph left 
And there was a lady in the church sitting in a chair in the aisle, and he all of a sudden, this lady said, I'm healed. And he said he looked over at her, and he thought, I'm going to finish my message. <laughs> and he started again, and this lady said, I'm healed. And she had double vision. And the whole church had been praying for her to be healed. And she got up and she started walking in the altar and all of a sudden someone over here said, I'm healed. And someone else said, I'm healed. And he never got to finish his message. <laughs> and they had more miracles that night than in the history of the church. There was an expectancy among the people. They were expecting God to do something. I'm, I'm asking you to believe that God is still with us and that God still does miracles. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I know I know that I know that I know I prayed through this, that I wouldn't just be standing to say something, but I know that I know that God told me that he's going to begin a season of miracles in Gateway Church. And it's going to begin this weekend, tonight. So I asked the, the elders before the service the, to, to be listening for words of knowledge words of wisdom whatever God wants to speak and so the first thing we're going to do in just a moment is some of the elders are going to come with some words and pray over groups of people and here's what I want to say to you let, let me pray for a minute and then give you some instruction Holy Spirit we ask you to come right now and God we want to tell you we, we believe you're a miracle working God. Miracles are not hard for you. And Lord, we're asking you for miracles tonight. And we receive by grace through faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I want to share with you for a few moments, and then I'm, I'm, I've asked Steve to share. And, um, but I want to start with a testimony. Uh, I know we get to hear a lot of testimonies in habitation about what God's done. And this is a testimony about my cousin who came this weekend and was here in our services last night. And my cousin, um, my, my father, I should say, let me start there, had two brothers, or had two brothers. Uh, one committed suicide, the other died an alcoholic. My father's the first Christian in his family. So the one who was an alcoholic had two sons, and um, one of them, you know, both those my cousins, one of them died of a drug overdose. The other cousin was here this weekend. The reason that he was here this weekend is because after I accepted Christ, and I did, did drugs with this cousin before I accepted Christ, but after I accepted Christ, uh, I got very burdened for him and went. He was at the University of Arkansas and um, going to school, and I went and spent, we spent about half the night uh, talking about the Lord, and he accepted Christ. And so this weekend he was here, and this is what I was thinking about. He's been married now to the same woman for 32 years, who's a pastor's daughter. <laughs> Their oldest daughter is a commercial airline pilot at the age of 28. Their middle daughter is about to graduate from medical school, and their son is about to graduate from college and go to seminary to become a pastor. What a difference Jesus makes. What a difference Jesus makes. And that's what I love about habitation because we're introducing people to Jesus. Jesus the Savior, hundreds, maybe thousands of people have been saved at our habitation services, Jesus the deliverer, Jesus the baptizer, 
and the Holy Spirit and Jesus the healer. We're introducing people to Jesus. So I, I, I love that. Um, I want to take you back. I want to share some vision for where we're going. And I want to take you back to kind of where we, where we started. How many of you have been a member of Gateway Church for less than 10 years? You came in the past 10 years. Okay. So before you got here, I had a vision to have a once a month Sunday night service to go deeper in the Holy Spirit. And I talked with the elders about that and the staff and the team. And so we began that service. We called it Encounter simply because I wanted every person to have an encounter with God at a deeper level, an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And God blessed that service. It gave us, we just wanted to have more time uh, to enter into the, Holy, to the presence of the Holy Spirit and to allow for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so we began that service. It began to grow. God began to do things. And then... Um, a few years after we began the service, Steve and I, you have to know, Steve and I have been best friends for um, probably over about 25 years now. And Steve was in business. You've heard him share stories about that. He owned a construction company. He was a, and is a founding elder of Gateway Church. Um, I think really the founding elders that are still here would be Tom and Steve sitting on the front row. I guess when you're a founding elder, you get to sit in the comfortable chairs. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. So, <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> okay. So, and and neither were local elders at that time. Tom was a, an elder uh, in Trin Trinity Church in Amarillo with Jimmy Evans, and Steve was an elder at another church in Dallas because he lived in North Dallas area. So they were apostolic elders along with Jimmy Evans as we began the church. And then God brought both of them here. But Steve came to me, and you gotta remember, he's, he's a businessman, been a businessman his whole life. And he started sharing with me these visions that he was having about him leading a service. And he be began to describe habitation services to me. And while he was sharing, I thought of our once a month Sunday night encounter services. And I said, Steve, you need to lead those. And he said, no, 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 that's, that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> I'm just telling you that I'm having these visions and I'm submitting them to you as my pastor and asking you, what do I do? I said, you need to start leading <laughs> these services. And again, you have to remember, he, he was in business. And um, he actually, he, some of the stories I'll tell tonight, he wouldn't want me to tell you, but um, I'm the pastor, so. And I know you have the last word, but these are honoring, okay? So he just would not want me to call attention to this. Uh, he paid a person who trains people how to speak that, that you would know of, I told you his name, if you know anything about speakers, you may have read his books. He trained Lee Iacocca to speak. He trained Bill Gates to speak. Steve paid him thousands and thousands of dollars to learn to speak so that he could get up here and, and lead you in what God was saying to him. In essence, so that he could hear, believe, and obey. So he could obey what God was telling him as a businessman to begin leading the, a once a month service like this. Um, Steve is, is the businessman that I refer to in the blessed life that for years gave over 50% of his income to the Lord. And so I am just very proud of him because he stepped out and has done a phenomenal, incredible job, a phenomenal job. And one of the things that um, I watched God do in his life was cause him to be able to lead people into the presence of God and how to recognize an encounter with God and facilitate that so that other people could have an encounter with, with the Lord. And so I watched him, him, him grow in that. Um, I remember the time he came into the elders meeting and said, guys, just stay with me. 
but I want to share with you about what I feel like we're supposed to do at the next habitation service. And it was the party. Do any of you remember the party? Were any of you at the party? The first, wait, wait a minute. There, there, we've been three, I think, so two. Okay, the very first one was in the old building, right? And so Steve came in and said, I believe we're supposed to give money away. And so we were like, okay, that's great with us. He said, I want to teach on the difference between a, a need and a want. And we want, I want to have people giving each other. I want to have the elders at the altar. And he was sharing this, the vision that he had. And he said, and I, I want to have, you know, five baskets with $10,000 in each. And I want us to give away 50000 Now, this is, again, something he wouldn't want me to tell you. But he said, and I'm going to give the 50000 And he did. And we said, Steve, we'll, we'll do that. He said, no, it's something God's told me to do. So he gave all that money that we gave away. And we just began to give that night. And if you were at that first one and, and even the second one, it's just phenomenal. And one of the things that happened, just to give you one testimony from that, is a, a lady, you may have heard this testimony, but it's one of my favorite ones. A lady came up, and she was standing in line, and we said, you know, if you feel led to give to someone, even if they're standing in line, just go give to them. And then we were telling the people, now, if you're in line and you have a specific need and people have come up and given you money, before you step up to the elder, count the money and see what God's done. And this lady needed, she was a single mom, she needed $1,200 to pay her bills that week. And so right before she stepped up to the elder, when the elder was talking to another person, she counted the money that people had just come up and given her, and she had exactly $1,200, exactly. And so when the person turned around, she said to the elder, I, I've, God's already met my need. And so he said, praise the Lord. And so she turned around and went back to her seat. Uh, so then we're asking for testimony. So she came up to share her testimony. And now while she's sharing her testimony, let me tell you the other part of the testimony. One of our um, NFL players that played for the Dallas Cowboys, he's retired now, but played for the Dallas Cowboys, his wife was in the service. Her husband was out of town working. <laughs> Don't tell me the score, I'm recording it. Okay. So, so anyway, so she's sitting there and says, Lord, what do you want me to give? And here's what the Lord said. I want you to give away all of your husband's shoes. Now, before any of you ladies get that word, <laughs> it'd be good if your husband played in the NFL and was given all of his shoes, all right? He had stacks of shoes, stacks, boxes of shoes, tennis shoes from, you know, uh, a sports company that, that he endorsed. And so... Uh, she actually texted her husband and said, I felt like God told me to give away all of your shoes. And he's like, great, you know, praise the Lord. So, <laughs> and so anyway, so uh, she said, but Lord, my husband wears a size 16. And the Lord said, I can take care of it. So when this lady's up sharing the testimony about $1,200 been given to her, she said, I have two teenage boys and they're big and they eat a lot. And the Holy Spirit spoke to this NFL player's wife and said, that's the lady you give the shoes to for her two teenage sons. So when the lady went to sit down, she walked over to her and said, ma'am, I know this sounds strange, but I'm supposed to give your sons my husband's shoes. And they're brand new in a box, a whole bunch of them. And the lady said, well, thank you so much, but my two boys are really big. They both wear size 16." So God knows what he's doing. By the way, hit the next week he was sharing that with some other players and then several of the Cowboys players got together and brought him suits and shirts and pants and came over, you know, so it's just a, it's cool. So then a few years ago, Steve sold his company and he and I prayed through that decision and we felt like he would do something to help business leaders. And so we prayed about that. Now, let me rewind a little more back to the very beginning of the church. Within the first year of the church, I said to the elders, um, I want to have some pastors on staff that I don't know if any church has pastors like these. And they said, okay, what are you, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I want to have a deliverance pastor. That was the only word I knew, and we call it now 
freedom ministry. It's a lot easier to say, where are you going? I'm going to freedom ministry class then. I'm going to deliverance. <laughs> you might get some people to confirm your decision to go get some deliverance, you know. So I said, I want a deliverance pastor and I want a business pastor. I said, you mean someone that runs the business of the church? I said, no, I mean someone that ministers to business people. So I said that the first year of the church. So within a few years, we got our freedom ministry pastor, and then, of course, these have grown into departments now. But after Steve sold his company, I thought, this is our business pastor. This, this is the guy that ministered to business leader. Who better than a person who's given 50% of his income away and retired at 50? It's not bad. This guy knows business. And I knew he did, and God had been training him in that area for years. So I talked to him, and I said, Steve, I think you ought to, you need to be our business pastor. And um, so he prayed about it. The elders prayed about it. Melody prayed about it. And so he stepped in that role a few years ago. Now the business leaders has taken off, um, and it's phenomenal. And it's going to go not just minister to business leaders here. It's going to go out of our church to other church, touch other churches around the world. Uh, I was talking to a business leader in our church a while back. I said, have you been to any of the business leader events? And he owns a, a, a large company, and he said, no. He said, you know, I, I know, though, that I need to support that ministry. And I said to him, wait, wait, you, you've totally misunderstood the business leader's ministry. We didn't start the business leader's ministry for you to support it. We started it for, so it would support you, so it'll help you. That's the business leader's ministry is for us to help you in business not for you to help the church. So Steve's been doing that. So about a year and a half ago, now I think it was, it was summer last year and he knows dates better than I, but I said, um, Steve, um, I, I see some where habitation I think is going in the future and I see where the business leaders ministry is going in the future. And I'm concerned about you being able to do both because I see both growing. Um, I want to see services like habitation services on every campus. Uh, we're not just a South Lake church. We're a, a Metroplex church. Uh, we're one church in multiple locations. About 60% of our church now does not attend the South Lake campus. They attend another campus. So we began to try to branch out some about a year and a half ago. And I said, even, even that, Steve, I need you to really pray and see about how we can do this. And then we begin to pray about how we can take the principles of habitation and build on those principles and yet enlarge it so that, again, every campus can experience something like this. And so we talked about it with campus pastors. We talked about it with the elders. Steve and I talked about it. We began to pray about it. So we are making a change next year to where we have um, nights of and I don't, uh, we're just still trying to figure out exactly what God is saying, but like nights of worship where we just focus on worship, and that's the focus. Nights of healing where we focus on healing. Nights of prayer where we focus on prayer. Nights of ministry. Uh, nights of the prophetic where we focus on the prophetic, much like we've done in habitation. But as Steve comes into the service with a focus, it'd be the same thing. It'd be a focus for that. And we'd let you know what that focus is before But where we're going, um, Steve prayed about it, and he's been leading habitation for seven years now. And where he's going, where God's calling him with the business leaders ministry, uh, we talked this summer about it, maybe even last spring, uh, late spring, but he doesn't feel like he's supposed to continue leading habitation services. And so there's a little bit of a sadness to the announcement I'm giving you. But there's also, hopefully, gladness of that where we're going to go, that we're going to try to allow more people to be able to experience what we've been experiencing and build on what God's been doing here. It always takes faith to take another step, always, because here's the fear. The fear is, but it's been really good. And in order to go forward, are we going to lose anything we've had. Well, my answer to that is that the habitation services got better than the encounter services because we answered the call to step forward. 
And now, as we take this broader to every campus and we begin to focus nights of worship or prayer or ministry or healing or testimonies or whatever are a party. I don't think we call it nights of a party, but whatever we call it, (laughs) nights of giving maybe, whatever it is, then I think it's going to just get better and better and better. You follow what I'm saying? Um, I was asking the Lord to speak to me a scripture for uh, tonight, and here's the scripture that God gave me. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. This is how I feel about Steve. He's been a faithful elder at Gateway Church since we began. And God called him as a businessman to do something that he had to stretch to do. And for seven years, he's been stretching to do that. And now God's calling him to do something else. And he's going to stretch to do that. But he's worthy of double honor. And before England, before we're going to I'm going to ask you to come up here in just a moment, but we're going to do things a little differently, but it's the same Holy Spirit. And all the elders are in agreement, staff's in agreement, Steve's in agreement. We believe God is speaking something to us, but it takes us faith to move there. And so we're going to step out and move. So I'm just very, very proud of my friend for what he's done for Gateway Church and for the kingdom of God for the past seven years. When God... When God called him to do something that was beyond himself and he has given himself to it, and not just him, he's been the leader, but the the entire habitation team the prayer team and the worship team and the leadership team of Habitation. It's been phenomenal. And so I I asked um, uh, our team to just put together a a video and uh, just to to share a little bit from Habitation. And then I'll ask Steve to come up. But I, I want you to watch this video. One night I was praying beside my bed about 10.30 at night and I went to a vision. I saw the sign, habitation. I saw the worship team. I saw myself speaking, came out of it, wrote down the notes, and this happened every night for almost four weeks. In February of the next year, we started doing habitation. Now, I'm a business guy. I've never led a service. I just remember going, I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) God, if you don't come through, this is not going to be very good. But then when I walked out into the sanctuary, everything was exactly like I'd seen it. So I knew that God was doing something. That next week, the testimony started coming in. People would come up and say, I got healed in habitation. My marriage got saved in habitation. My finances got healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Maybe 12 or 13 years ago, I had a vision of being a conductor in a two-level auditorium. When I had that vision, Gateway was not two levels. When we actually built our current auditorium with 4,000 seats, I walked out onto the platform and looked up, and I realized this is where the vision was. One of my favorite services was an airline pilot and had this heart disease and could die at any moment. Forget about the aviation career. Right now, we need to basically kind of keep you stable because this could get worse and we may have to transplant your heart. And he came up after habitation service and Melly and I prayed for him. In order for me to go back to work, the FAA requires me to have an injection fraction minimum 40%. The mugger scan, whatever the number is, that's it. There's no disputing it. On the mugger, it said 57%. It's, it's just amazing to watch what God can do. Probably one of the things that stuck out to me the most was the party. 
So tonight, we're going to have a party, and there's going to be people here tonight who give, and there are going to be people here tonight who receive. Love is giving to others, expecting nothing in return. 100, 200, 300 people got ministered to financially that night. It was an amazing, amazing service that only God could orchestrate. I, I get testimonies every week. Every kind of testimony you think. People getting healed of addictions, uh, prodigals coming home, uh, jobs, finances, uh, marriages restored. Every time I get one, I'm still amazed. Still amazed that God loves His people so much, He's willing to touch them and intervene in their lives and meet their needs. And it's just still amazing to me. Our motto at Habitation is hear, believe, and obey. And as people started doing that, and it started spreading really inside Habitation, but then it started affecting the people in the church. And uh, that's one of our models now at Gateway Church is hear, believe, and obey, because we believe if we hear God, we believe Him and we obey to do our part, He'll show up and do only what He can do. It's been an incredible privilege to be able to lead Habitation uh, these seven years and I'm just grateful to God. And I know that as I continue to follow Him, that uh, He'll continue to bless my life and bless the life of others. So will you please welcome my friend and an elder who is worthy of double honor, Pastor Steve Doolin. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, you can be seated. Are you excited about being here tonight? I've now said that 70 times. Um, <clears throat> it's been an incredible honor to uh, serve Pastor Robert and the elders of Gateway Church and you, uh, it's been an incredible honor to serve the Lord. I wish, I wish that you could get the testimonies that I get. I really do. I wish you could see the things that I get to see, the, the things, the way the Lord has moved. And it's, a, it's an incredible, incredible privilege that I'm very, very grateful for. Um, you know, in February 2017 or 16, this year, in February, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Steve, you're, you're not going to do habitation in 2017. And you know how the Lord speaks? And then it's like, well, God, why not? And it's like, he doesn't have to answer. <laughs> uh, have y'all noticed that? Has anybody besides me ever noticed that? He just, he just, he doesn't have to answer. And uh, so it was amazing, Robert and I, we went to lunch I don't know, a couple weeks later, and the Lord has spoke, already spoken that to Pastor Robert. And uh, so we started talking about, well, what would that look like and transitioning and all that. You know, um, when the Lord gave me hear, believe, and obey, I, I'm not immune. <laughs> I've got to hear, believe, and obey also. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, oversee Gateway business leaders. Uh, if you're a business leader, we have a breakfast next Friday that you're invited to. Just uh, uh, send me an email, and we'll send you an invitation to it. Uh, that's pretty good. Well, I might as well start promoting the, the ministry, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> it's, been, uh, it's been incredible seven years. I mean, our family has been uh, so involved, but also so impacted. Um, my daughter, Kristen, uh, after three or four years of marriage, was trying to have a baby, couldn't have a baby. And we prayed for her. Y'all remember this? I see the people nodding. And she got pregnant. Now I have a granddaughter, Ella. And... Uh, it was a miracle. The doctor, the doctor said, this is a miracle. There is no other explanation. And uh, I just happened, I think, to have a picture of Ella here. Uh, so that was for you, Pastor Robert. I just, <laughs> okay. 
I just couldn't resist that. Just keep her up there. I think it's awesome. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I was telling a pre-service prayer. Uh, the vision started 10 years and nine days ago. So 10 years ago tonight, I would, I would have had a vision because I had a vision for less than, you know, every, almost four weeks, every night. And it started on November 4th. This is November 13th. This been, so can you imagine every night I would kneel beside my bed and go into prayer and go into a vision, have no idea where I was, uh, no idea what had happened. All I knew is I was seeing a vision and I would come out of it every night for almost four weeks. And so this night, 10 years ago, I would have here another couple, you know, three hours or so, I would have been in a vision what God was speaking to me and directing me. He knew that as a business owner, the only chance I had to lead a service was if he told me exactly and showed me exactly what to do. <laughs> that's how much he thought of my ability. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's always what I thought about my ability too. So, uh, you know, I've, uh, so I've just, I've been grateful to get to be here and participate, if you want to know the truth. And uh, so I remember about two months before that, the Lord spoke to me and said, things are about to change dramatically. You know, being a faith-filled Christian, I said, well, is that in a good way or a bad way? <laughs> and he said, in a good way. And I got started having the visions a couple months after that. Uh, I wanna say, I wanna tell you how much that you are loved, okay? Can I just give you like a, an illustration of how much you are loved? Would that be okay? I, I figured it out this week. Our Habitation prayer team has prayed for you when you take, let's say there was 30 people at a meeting and we, were, we prayed for two hours, that'd be 60 hours. But we have prayed for you over 15,000 hours. That's how much we love you. Uh, and you know, of course, Tim and Kelly, we started praying. Uh, we prayed for y'all just before habitation ever started. Just us, just, I'm just counting one person, 240 hours, four people would be 1,000 hours that we prayed before we ever started habitation. Um, and of course, prayer is the foundation of habitation. Um, I came out before the service, the pre-service prayer, and just thanked everyone because the prayer is what moves the hand of God. And we've seen the hand of God move so dramatically, so amazingly, so many times. I know that prayer has been what's done it. Uh, just so you'll know, last year, uh, through people attending Habitation, watching online, or going to our website to view a Habitation service, with somewhere between 175 and 200,000 people were touched last year. This year, it'll be about the same, 175 to 200,000 people. Can, can, can I brag on God for just a second? Would that be okay? Uh, people have been saved. This is what I wrote down, filled with the Holy Spirit. They become disciples of Jesus. People have been healed in worship. They've been set free from addictions. They've been healed during the service. Young men and women have found their spouses. Women who couldn't have children became pregnant. Widows and single parents have been blessed. And multiple, hundreds of thousands of people's lives have been changed because of what God decided to do one night with a business guy that knew very little about anything. And Pastor Robert agreed, heard God and agreed. And so I wanna thank, none of that would have been possible without everyone here. And I just wanna thank a few people, if that's okay. I wanna take a second. Pastor Rob, of course, I wanna start with you. Uh, <laughs> I know he's your best friend, but, but I remember look, watching you when I started sharing these visions, the look in your eyes like, I sure hope, I sure hope he doesn't think that he's gonna lead a service. <laughs> <laughs> and then as the... <laughs> He's, a, he's, not a, he's not a staff pastor. And then, uh, but then you saw that it was God. And you, you're a guy who leads Gateway, Gateway Church in a way that, I, here's what I say, Gateway Church is blessed. Because Pastor Robert and the Gateway Elders will do anything. And I mean anything God says. And I could talk to you for hours at things that we've done because God spoke it. That made no logical sense. But because Pastor Robert, hears God, believes God and obeys God, and will do anything God says. And I wanna thank you for giving me an opportunity to grow and to stretch and to learn. And it's been a, I can't tell you what an honor it's been to serve you and your vision for a spirit-filled service that went a little longer than a weekday service and your heart to see people's lives change. And I just wanna thank you. 
And I love you very much. I want to I want to thank Tim and Kelly Shepherd. Uh, I don't know where usually they're over here somewhere. Where are they? Oh yeah, he's supposed to be on the platform. That's right. I'm not quite myself tonight. Uh, Tim and Kelly Shepherd. We prayed every week for over a year, every week on Saturday night for three, four, six, sometimes two, three o'clock in the morning, seeking the Lord. Uh, they've been here every step of the way. In the visions, Tim was the, Tim was the worship leader every single service. I barely knew Tim Shepherd. I've met him probably four or five times and I have these visions. Here's Tim in these visions. And so I went to him and said, Tim, you won't believe what I've seen. And we started praying and uh, you've been the most faithful, great, incredible worship leader, you and Kelly and Jessica. And I just wanna thank you. I mean, you've been amazing. It's been an honor and privilege to walk with you and to seek God together, the, all the, the early morning hours, the late night hours, and everything in between, your house, our house, wherever it might be. Thank you, Tim. I love you and I'm so appreciative. You're incredible. I wanna, I wanna thank our, our habitation prayer team. Um, about 30 people, I don't know if they're all here tonight. Uh, some of them are ministering or you know, praying somewhere, but uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't, wouldn't even think about doing it without our habitation prayer team. It's about 30 people. Uh, every Thursday morning we meet for two hours to pray for this service, ask God to do things in people's lives. Uh, and then on Sunday night, we meet for about four hours, the Sunday night before habitation, uh, we meet and, um, and, uh, and just pray for you guys. And we've got to see amazing, amazing things. It's been a privilege for me and an honor. Uh, would y'all stand, if y'all are here, would y'all just stand up? If you've served on the habitation uh, ministry team, would you please just stand up? And, <laughs> and we got a couple of our elders. Thank you. I wanna thank the worship team. Um, man, um, you know, when I get to heaven, I may, I may ask God if I can come back on the weekends for worship. So, uh, Incredible worship team. Would y'all would would y'all stand? Where are y'all? I, mean, I know you're here somewhere up here. And of course, we have lots of other people that participate. Thank you. Uh, the TA team, David Loistner, Andy Engstrom, Meredith, Kyra, uh, our whole Gateway staff, our ushers, our greeters, our, our child care workers. Thank you. Y'all have sacrificed, y'all have served with a heart of excellence. And I just wanna thank you very, very much. And I so appreciate y'all putting up with me all these years. <laughs> and then, uh, um, and most of all, I wanna thank my family, um, uh, Melody and Kristen and Cassie, Gabe and Ella. Y'all have uh, been there every step of the way. Every time I speak, I, I speak first to uh, Melody and Cassie, and it used to be Kristen before she got married, and, and uh, oh, it's a beating. It's an absolute beating. The reason that you're even able to listen to what I share is because they change everything, <laughs> everything. They say, we love it, we love it, Steve, but just change everything, and change it like this. And so uh, some of my bad jokes have come from Cassie and Melody, and uh, y'all have been absolutely incredible. You're the love of my life, and uh, we have the closest family you can possibly imagine. And uh, thank you. I just want to say thank you. Would y'all thank them for countless hours? Countless. And then uh, I want to say thank you to the elders. You know, this is the one thing that we have gotten to minister together. I remember we kind of launched out the campuses, and I thought, and we'd send elders out, and I thought, we're my friends. I'm sending my friends out. Uh, I can't tell you. What an honor it's been for me to serve with the greatest group of elders in the world, absolutely in the world. To, I mean, we are over there. You got anything? Anybody got anything? What's the Lord saying? Anybody got anything? What's God doing? And just, you've been ministered. What, a, uh, what an honor to get to minister to the greatest bunch of guys in the world and the most uh, wonderful ministers in the world. The heart that the, you have for the people of Gateway and how much you love them never ceases to amaze me. And I just want to say thank you. Would you thank our Gateway elders? Most of them are here tonight. <laughs> and 
And then I want to thank you. Um, you know, it wouldn't have happened without you. You come in and praying. You come in and believing. Uh, you pressed in. You sought God. And uh, God shows up in a corporate anointing. More than he will with a personal anointing. And you brought your personal anointings. They joined together for a corporate anointing. And we saw God do some amazing, amazing things. Why don't you just give yourself a hand for coming and bringing your personal anointing. You know, I like to say that habitation is about relationship. Every one of us can be as close to God as anyone who ever lived. I don't know if you've ever thought, I haven't said that in years, but any one of us can be as close to God as anyone who ever lived. Can you imagine? And that's my heart, that we would all get as close to God as we can possibly be. Habitation was never about God coming and inhabiting a service. It was always about God coming and inhabiting us. That we would be a habitation of God and we would go out with the presence of God. So uh, Cassie told me I don't have time to share this, but I'm gonna share it anyway. <laughs> 10 things I hope we learned at habitation. 10 things I hope we learned at habitation. Number, um, she told me to count it down. So number 10, all things are possible to him who believe. With God, nothing is impossible. Amen? Amen? Number nine, if we will believe God and do our part, God will always do his part. Amen? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If we change our thinking to line up with God's word, we will change our life. That's what a disciple is. If we'll change our thinking, we will change our lives. Number seven, testimonies are the spirit of prophecy. When we share a testimony, we are prophesying and asking God to do it again. Did we learn that at Habitation? We've seen it over and over and over again. Number six, if we believe lies about healing, it can keep us from getting healed. We have to believe the truth about what God says about healing, and, we, and God can and does heal. Amen? Amen? Man, that's a big one. For those who were there that night, this goes, I won't explain this, never give up, never get out, never give in. <laughs> Number four, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Something we learned at Habitation, amen, in a deeper way. Number three, become a disciple who makes disciples. This whole year we've talked about discipleship, becoming a disciple and making disciples. Number two, we are a habitation of God. Each and every one of us is a habitation of God. And number one, I pray if we learned anything that we learned this at Habitation. Anybody know what it is? Hear, believe, obey. Amen? Can we thank God? <laughs> okay, you know that I have, uh, every month we do an assignment, so here's your assignment. Everybody ready for your assignment? All right, I wrote this down so I wouldn't just, okay, here it is. If God healed you through Habitation, Go out and pray for others to be healed. If you were blessed financially at Habitation, go out and bless others financially. Now, this is a hard one, so be, make sure and listen to this very carefully. If you had a baby because of a miracle God did at Habitation, <laughs> do not go out and have a baby with someone else. <laughs> go out and pray for God to do miracles and give life to more children. If you made Jesus your Lord and Savior through habitation, go out and lead others to the Lord. If you were filled with the Holy Spirit at habitation, go out and pray for others to be filled with the Spirit. If you learn to hear God at habitation, go out and speak the word of God and teach others to hear him. If you learn how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ at habitation, go out and make more testimonies. Tell your testimony and watch God do it again. Let's go out, the Holy Spirit be with us. We come into the presence of God, we go out with the presence of God. 
Let's go take God to a lost and dying world. Amen? Amen. I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Uh, oh, by the way, after watching the video, I know what my New Year's resolution is going to be. <laughs> I'm going to lose a little weight. Okay, so, uh, oh, man, who is that guy up there? Uh, Father, we just come in Jesus' name. Lord, we're so grateful to you and all that you've done. We, um, it's been an amazing time, God, to get to come and see God, God show up and do absolute miracles in people's lives. Things that are undeniable, things that doctors have confirmed, things that have changed people's lives for eternity. They've changed their destiny, changed the fact whether they even live or not. Lord, we're just so grateful. We're just so thankful. And Lord, I just pray blessings on each one here and those who've come to habitation. Lord, I pray that they will take your presence to everyone they meet. Lord, that, that uh, the things that we've seen, that you do, that we'll be a witness of, that we'll give a testimony, we'll see many others come to Christ, see many others get healed and saved and delivered, set free. So God, I just thank you. I ask you to bless each one here with your amazing grace, your amazing love, and your amazing blessings. I ask this in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen.